everyone and welcome to Science Today. I'm your host Judy Naylor. We're here on a beautiful day in Hamburg, New York and we're at the Penn Dixie Paleontology Site and I'm here with Jerry Bastido who is the president of the Hamburg Natural History Society. Jerry, welcome to the show. Well, welcome to the site. Uh, Judy, glad to have you out here and uh, glad you made it out to the Penn Dixie Site. Uh, now today's a really special day. Uh, you're having the public come in and you have a lot of activities. How often does your group do things like this? We uh, run a public day once a month, May through uh, October, and uh, we have primarily people out to collect fossils, but we also do some astronomy programs. In fact, today there are people here that are showing so, uh, sunspots, and uh, we also have a, a solar walk that's going to be set up, and we also do some astronomy programs, evening programs for the people too. So we're hoping to expand our programming into birding and some of the other natural sciences, but right now we're primarily focusing on the fossils and the astronomy. Oh. Tell us a little bit about the organization. How did it get started and what is your mission? Well, we started actually as a group in uh, around 1990 uh, to go ahead and save this property for fossil collecting. Uh, at the time I was at the Science Museum during the 70s, we used to bring groups out here to collect fossils. Also, there were groups brought out here for the birds and the two ponds on site, so a lot of natural science activities could be conducted on the site. And because of the threat of light industrial park development in this area, the group got together and worked with the town of Hamburg to go ahead and help preserve this site for future generations. And uh, Mark Cavacoli from the town of Hamburg, town councilman, worked with us and the town board supported our project. And to make a long story short, they ended up, the town of Hand Hamburg ended up buying the Pendixie site and they gave 32 and a half acres of it to the Hamburg Natural History Society, which was really nice. The Hamburg Natural History Society was formed in 1993 to go ahead and preserve, develop, and uh, create programming on the site. When we received the property in January of 96, we realized that it could be uh, used not only just for fossil collecting and the astronomy programs we were doing, but a bunch of other things. And we can, we're hoping to do a lot of different programs here by putting up a building, a handicapped accessible nature trail, and we want to run a lot of educational programs out of here. And of course the fossils will still be here, and uh, we have an inexhaustible supply of fossils for people. <laughs> so there's fossils all over the site, which is nice. Now you have a map here that shows some of the uh, things that you have. Tell us what yeah. you have right here. Well, this is an early rendition of what the uh, the site was like and what we depicted the activities were going to be on the site. And this was done by uh, our treasurer, Peg Herman, and she's a, a fantastic artist. In fact, you might even meet Tilly the Trilobite a little bit later, <laughs> which will be an interesting little uh, piece of information to say. Uh, trilobites are animals that were like sow bugs, and they've been extinct for 250 million years. But we sort of envisioned the site with a building with a handicapped accessible nature trail that would go around the site and also around the ponds. The fossil collecting areas are down on the uh, northern end of the site and you have trilobites that are here, there's horn corals, and we have brachiopods over here. Uh, crinoid stems are all over the site and all over this side are more uh, cephalopods and different types of animals. Now the site has a lot of wildlife on it too. We have turkey and deer here, a lot of birds. We're under a major hawk route here. And of course, the area, because it's sheltered by trees and a lot of vegetation, offers a good place for astronomy programs. And we've been doing a lot of astronomy evening programs out here too. And that we hope to be expanding in the future. Of course, we need a parking area, we need a building, we need the restrooms, which everyone wants. <laughs> and today we have portable toilets out here, but it's nice to have the real facilities. So we have a lot of plans for it. And once the building is up, we want to run programs both in the evening and on weekends and during the day and things like that. So right now we have been running a lot of school groups, scout groups, 4-H groups, campfire groups, church groups, amateur groups, and also a lot of college groups have been through this summer. And uh, actually we've been really happy this year. We've had a lot of people from out of the country. We've had a girl here from Ecuador, uh, a guy from a young kid who's been trying to get in here for two years from England, a German professor here, and uh, on in August here we had a group of Nature Center naturalists on a site and there was a lady there from Japan and she actually took out a membership so now we have a member in Japan which is fantastic and she was just loves the idea of the fossils because Japan they don't have any fossils so she had a great time with it and our membership continues to expand we have about a membership in the society of about 250 people of which 20 percent are out of state and we this summer also we've had a lot of people from California, Colorado, Yuma, Arizona and different places like that and you know I'd uh, encourage your viewers if they'd like to to join the Hamburg Natural History Society and if they want more information they can contact us at 627-4560 and we'd love to have everyone come out and help support what we're trying to do here. We have this uh, fundraising campaign going on to mm -hmm. build the uh, building and put in the nature trails so we can use all the help we can get. Yeah. Sounds really ambitious. That's just wonderful that you're doing so much. Um, now you have some other diagrams here too that are... Yes, I do. Terrific. This is a, 
a rendering. We had uh, actual plans uh, drawn up with a cost estimate for the site. And this is the site in whole with the 32 acres. You can see the building down here with the parking area and the trails that go back through the site and they'll eventually go around the ponds and come back around and also through the fossil areas. And so we really have some pretty ambitious plans here. This whole project to put everything in is about $1.75 million altogether. So it's really quite an ambitious project, but uh, something we hope to do. Now, we also have, give you a more detailed uh, view of the building. This is our uh, building plans, and to put our building up, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost about $1.2 million. We have a couple classrooms set up here, uh, a community room, which will be used for meeting rooms. That will hold 120 people, an exhibit room, and a media room, which will uh, serve as a library, computers, audiovisual, and things like that. Then uh, a gift shop, offices, and we also have the restrooms, which will be an outside entrance only here because when it gets rains out here it gets oh, really muddy I bet. <laughs> and some of the other educational rooms and facilities like that so we're really excited about this building and everyone would like to see this thing up as soon as possible so we're got a fundraiser that's working with us to uh, go ahead and uh, put the building up another thing we have that's going on pretty exciting I mentioned the wetlands a uh, little windy today huh <laughs> yeah, sure is. we have um, a local developer that has to do a wetland mitigation project where they have to go and replace some wetlands. And this is the basic design for that wetland plan. The two ponds that you saw in the previous drawings, well, they will be excavated, reconstructed, and uh, revegetated. So we'll have a major wetland of about 3.74 acres on the site. And then we will run the, the nature trails around the pond and use as an outdoor classroom for a lot of the school groups that would come through and uh, also for birds and everything else. So it should be really, we're really pretty excited about what's going on there. And uh, that should be hopefully started this fall, early winter, and uh, by next summer it should be done. And then we should be able to put our nature trail around the site and start to really construct. Oh, that's terrific. Well, best of luck in, in doing all those things. Yeah, Tell you. us a little bit um, about some of the, you, know, you mentioned some of the fossils that people can find when they come here. What are a lot of the questions that you get, or the most common questions that people have when they come here? How much do they know about fossils before they get here? Well, it's interesting because most people want to come out and they say, we're the dinosaurs. <laughs> and unfortunately, in New York State, we don't have any dinosaur bones at all. But what we tell them is that our fossils here are 380 million years old, and they're older than the dinosaurs. So dinosaurs... Yeah. Yes, that's even better. You know, that's <laughs> even more impressive. I think what amazes most people, most of the people that come out here have not done a lot of fossil collecting. And we have about 40 to 50 volunteers that work with us, with the officers. And um, we uh, take people down, introduce them to fossils, tell them a little bit about how they lived, and uh, give them a little geology of the site. And this area at one time was covered by oceans, probably 100 to 200 feet deep in water. We were 20 to 30 degrees south of the equator and uh, everything, the closest land mass was probably the Adirondacks at that time. So we were pretty much, this was all ocean, there was no land around. And the kids are really amazed by that, but then one thing is they can find things. Every time it rains here, it washes out more fossils, and it's fantastic. It's just like reseeding the site, but we don't do that. They just wash out. We have a lower layer here that's very fossiliferous, and uh, it really yields a lot of fossils for us. So the things are literally just laying on the ground. And uh, we'll take you down and take you around, and we'll show you what some of these things are, uh, how easy they are to find. Some of the people like to collect the trilobites, which are like sow bugs. They're a little bit more difficult to get complete, but uh, they can be found here too and we have people coming in from all over the country as I said to collect these things so it's we really probably primarily have a lot of amateurs but we also have a lot of um, or uh, actually new people to the thing but then we have a lot of amateurs too and professionals we've had a lot of college students through and a lot of college groups lately in fact next weekend we have two groups coming in from Michigan and one from Brockport uh, this past weekend St. Lawrence University was here and a couple weeks ago University of Toledo was here so we had you know quite a smattering of people coming through it's been really exciting so. And I, I see there's a lot of families here today, so it's oh, yeah. great to see all ages. Yeah. What types of things do people need to bring with them? I mean, do you have to have certain equipment to look for fossils, or what do you advise people to do? Well, we uh, tell people uh, that if they are going to use hammer and chisels to wear some sort of safety glasses because we don't want to get their eyes injured. But really, the little garden claw tools work very well where you can go ahead and just claw them out. A lot of things, like I said, are laying on the surface. Ziploc bags to put them in, paper towels, something like that. That works out really well. If you really want to get uh, some of the better trilobites, uh, you've got to come in and do some digging, and uh, you know that helps a little shovel and maybe the hammer and chisel and things uh, to dig out the real good, real good ones. But some things are laying just on the surface sometimes, so mm -hmm. it's great. 
Now, say for instance I brought my family and we were looking for fossils and we found something interesting, but we didn't know what it was. Are there people who can help us identify right. what we found? Yeah, we've uh, we've got a really good crew of volunteers and most of our people know what these are. We also have fossil identification cards that we give out, which will help people. Also, a little rendering of what the site was like 380 million years ago, so they got an idea. You know, it was all underwater, and we talk a little bit about the geology and that. And and most of our leaders are pretty well versed in it, and they can identify things. Occasionally, though, there will be some strange things that come up that are rare. Not everything's been found, and that's what we tell people. You know, you may find something that's really rare. Uh, some people find that hard to believe. They think everything's been found, but it hasn't. Even on this site, where there's been thousands of people through, uh, we still are finding new things. So it's really pretty exciting there. Now, can people keep the fossils that they find? Yeah, that's the other thing that's quite amazing to them, too. They don't realize, they think, do we have to give our fossils back? And we said, no, you can yes, keep everything you want. <laughs> Probably this year, we've had hundreds of thousands of fossils come off the site. So it's been really pretty nice. And uh, it's, it's nice to see the kids be able to collect these things. And it doesn't take them very long. Yesterday, we had a group out here. And in a matter of about 15 minutes, I saw somebody had collected almost 100 fossils themselves. So it was really pretty nice. But uh, so they can keep everything they collect, you know, and it works out really well. Jerry, tell us a little bit about your own background. How did you get involved in the group? How did you get interested in, in paleontology? Well, I, I guess that goes back to my undergraduate years at Geneseo, and I did there, and when I got out of school, I ended up with a job at the Science Museum, and I worked in the uh, geology department at the Buffalo Museum of Science for about nine and a half years, and uh, that was a good experience, and uh, I also got my master's degree in paleontology, and, and that worked out really well. And then I went, uh, while I was there at the museum, I got into teaching adult ed, and uh, I really did a variety of geology programs in uh, for the museum and a lot of them were field trip oriented and of course I always came out here plus other places in western New York so uh, after I left the museum I went and did oil and gas exploration and uh, continued to teach and from there I went on to uh, yeah then from there I went to the environmental business and uh, I've been like nine years everywhere now and continue to do that and then when this group got started you know just continued on with it and we uh, you know really good interest in it you know it's been a good time and we've enjoyed it a lot so it's worked out well Great. Um, I'd just like to give our viewers, um, again, the number to, to reach the Society if they're interested in membership sure. or finding out more about your activity. Yes, they can uh, call 627-4560 uh, and leave a message there, and uh, we'll get back to them. You know, during the day, we're not there, but uh, as we're all working, we're all a volunteer group right now. Take a message, right? Yeah, take, we take messages and we do call people back. And uh, uh, when we get the building up, we hope to have a staff on board. And right now, we're working with all volunteers, which is really nice. Great. Okay, well, thanks, and we'll take a look around the site, yep. right? Right, we'll take you around the site now. You can see some of the things that are going on around the site, okay? Well, we're really having fun today. We've moved over a little bit further, and I'm going to be talking with Art Delo, who is a board member of the Society, and he's also the Planetarium Director at Buffalo State. So glad to have you here with us. I thank you very much, yes. I'm glad you came over. Uh, we, uh, we have a couple telescopes that are set up here, but I'd like to briefly uh, uh, mention what we have done in the past here, uh, as uh, astronomy-wise, um, when, uh, when the asteroids were, were hitting Jupiter. We had a group here on the site, not far from where we're standing right now, and uh, we had our 10-inch uh, our, uh, telescope aimed at Jupiter, and uh, we saw the, the I'm going to call it the black eye, okay? Uh, we saw a couple of them on the, on the wow, planet, and, uh, and I thought that was uh, a really spectacular thing to see from this distance using a small telescope. Oh, you're not kidding. That's wonderful. Wonderful. Um, how often do you have the astronomy events here? Uh, usually we have them uh, based on uh, uh, meter showers, uh, like the Perseid meter shower. And uh, but what we're hoping for is to have more events, uh, possibly uh, every week, oh, weather right. permitting, have something. Of course, once the once uh, October comes around, all the clouds come in, then it might be a little difficult. We may have to wait until we have uh, better better weather through through the winter. Uh, back uh, probably yeah. in the spring, mm, okay. uh, but we'll see what happens there. Sure. What are we looking at today? Uh, today, let's see. Uh, what, uh, what, what, what I've got a small spotting scope here. <laughs> oh, tell us your name first. My name is Paul Zimmer. Okay, well, I'm a member of the society here. Uh, I've got a small spotting scope, which I use quite often for just viewing. Uh, this is for terrestrial, which is looking at the Earth objects and or looking into space. The view that you see through here is upright, so if you're looking at people or anything else, you'll see them as we do see them. If you look through this type of telescope, everything's upside down and backwards. So that's really not good for viewing anything on Earth, terrestrial, 
but it's good for the heavens. Of course, it doesn't matter if you're looking forward, backward, or left to right when you're looking at the sun or anything else. Today we do have a solar filter on here. We're trying to look at the sunspots, and we've been successful, but we do have some clouds, unfortunately. Tell us a little bit about, for our audience, what the sunspots are and what, why are they significant? Uh, basically, they're big storms on the sun, big hurricanes or what have you, about the size of the Earth, probably. Some are bigger, some are smaller. We see them as little dots through this telescope because it's not a very big scope. Um, obviously, it sends out uh, electrically charged particles throughout the atmosphere and into our Earth, and it does affect our radio and TV signals. Um, probably other facets of life, too, that we don't know about yet, but uh, naturally the seasons and the ozone layer and what have you on that. Lights. The northern lights, That's yes. Right. Yes. When we have a, we're moving into a big sunspot activity period now. It's 11 year cycles on the sun. And uh, we're starting to come into a, a rather active uh, series of sunspots. So we've been trying to take pictures and or just uh, drawings as we see it, you know, every chance we get. Um, and they change quite a bit. Uh, the sun is always moving around. The poles move faster than the middle. Uh, so there's, there's always some kind of activity. Of course, it's a big gas ball anyway, so it's rotating. Uh, it's rotating. Right. Okay. Yes. What is the, now tell us about that, you said there's a special filter on that, now would that, what does that do, how does that, it makes it safe for you it to look it at safe. it? Right, um, without that obviously you go blind if you look at the sun, and uh, it's like a welder's glass if you're familiar with that, uh, the welder, the welding material is so bright that'll blind you too, so it just like dulls the image for you. Uh, you can see the sun beautifully through here. It's a great big orange ball, and it's just got these little black dots on it. It filters out the ultraviolet rays, which are which are harmful to your eyes. And uh, maybe we'd like to go over and uh, and uh, talk to the observer. Sure. Yeah. Let's... Hi. How are you? Tell us what you're doing. What What's your name first? Uh, Rich Switzer, and uh, I'm just letting the people see the sunspots. Uh, it's kind of hard to get it in without the clouds, though. But, what uh, types of questions are they asking you? Too many. <laughs> I can't answer them all. How long does the solar spots last and things like that? But they're quite interested in that. And uh, what it would take to, to see other stuff at night, if this would be appropriate for them to see things, you know, so I'd tell them, you know, a bigger scope would be for this or a smaller one for certain things, you know. But usually this here is not a bad size scope for someone to learn on. It's right. nice, you know, it's an eight inch reflector. And uh, you can see quite a bit with it. What's your background in, ast in astronomy uh, or in, just, in this? I'm just uh, amateur, that's all. I just started that's doing it for a couple, of year, uh, a couple of years. I just had the scope. So I just started on it, what? learning like everybody else. <laughs> I learned from him. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> this, uh, this is a real nice area. We're, 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 right now, I'm facing south, and uh, the planets, the moon, and the sun all Go, we'll go across the sky, uh, right over the right over the uh, appendix site, <laughs> and uh, it it clears the the trees by uh, 30 degrees. So we've got we've got a lot of nice uh, viewing. Yes, yes, and and you're not too close to the city either, where the no, the lights would be a problem. No, that's right? right. There's a lot of light pollution out in that direction towards the north, and towards the south there really isn't. Uh, if there's a night game, we might see the lights uh, from the stadium. Um, but we uh, we plan to have some uh, some bushes or trees lined up over here so we can keep out some some lights that uh, might be from the homes. And uh, outside of that, uh, we, we've got a pretty nice nice area to do some observing. We're going to have an observation pad. Oh, wonderful! Uh, which uh, which will be located right out um, uh, a little bit beyond the uh, the center that we're going to have. And uh, with this observation pad, uh, we'll be able to set up our telescopes and uh, get a lot of people coming down, bringing their telescopes, I hope. Great. And, uh, and uh, we'll be able to see a lot of interesting things coming up. Now, I'd like to be uh, on site in November because uh, in November we have the Leonid showers. Tell us now, what's significant about, what's significant about those? Uh, the, the Leonid uh, uh, meteor shower, um, uh, the meteor showers come from comets that have buzzed by through the through this part of the uh, well through the solar system, and uh, this this happened just uh, just uh, early this, earlier this year. So a lot of the remnants from that a lot of the material left over from that comet is still fresh and still bunched together, and the Earth's uh, the Earth as it travels in its orbit around the sun is going to travel through 
a lot of that material and we uh, uh, this doesn't happen often maybe every 33 years or or so and uh, and it's 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 gonna work uh, hopefully count uh, uh, thousands an hour <laughs> well they're talking this is wonderful they're talking maybe uh, 50 60 hundred thousand an hour it's oh gonna goodness. be quite a quite a shower uh, like the 4th of July in November so. I think this is great too because I mean at home I, I don't have a telescope or any you know any way to look and I think it's wonderful that you have this here and you have the information for people how much background do people have do they know much about um, astronomy when they come or what type of things do they ask um, I've uh, I've discovered that uh, a lot of the people that, that come and look through our telescopes uh, may, may have not may have never seen the rings of Saturn and all of a sudden it's like oh my goodness look at those and they're so excited and it makes you so excited as an observer you sort of dancing around and <laughs> oh this is wonderful I'm really helping these people they've never seen the rings of Saturn so um, uh, we do get a, a a, a group that uh, that have uh, that belong to different ast astronomy clubs, and they come in, so they have a little bit of a background, so they know mm -hmm. they know quite a bit. So we uh, once we find out that they know a little bit, we try to recruit them. Oh, sure. <laughs> come on yeah. in and and, and enjoy uh, enjoy everybody. Hey, well, this is a wonderful program, and and thanks so much. We're gonna You're be welcome. looking around the rest of the site, but we've really enjoyed hearing about this. We, Thank you too. We have uh, we have a crew of about uh, eight at the present time. Wonderful. Can always use some more though, huh? Yes. People call? Yes. Okay, That's great. True. Hey, That's well, thanks. Cool. Okay, thanks very much. Did you got a rubber arm? Did you got a rubber arm? Did you got a rubber arm? Did Tom, where are you going? Got yeah, we got a bog in here, pardon me. Did you got a rubber arm? It's has. Huh? Pitcher has a rubber arm. If education is important to you, talk to your child's school about raising academic standards. Call 1-800-38-BE-SMART for a free booklet and be a big league parent. Over two million acres of our wildlands burn each year, and hundreds of homes are lost as a result. At least 50 homes were burned to the ground. Dozens more were damaged as fires raced through dense brush and steep canyons. Flames don't know the difference between forest, rangelands, and homes. Learn how you can fireproof your home. For more information, contact your local fire protection agency, state forestry office, or the USDA Forest Service. We're here in the sign-up area. This is the first area that you come to when you come to the Penn Dixie site. Um, park your car and come right up here and sign in. They have refreshments, and right behind me here is the sign for the Hamburg Natural History Society. Um, established 1993 and we have a special guest over here maybe Jerry you would introduce her well this is Tilly the trilobite actually Peg Herman in disguise and Peg made this outfit and Tilly uh, makes appearances a lot of the shows that we do and when we're out doing exhibits at various programs and things like that and uh, uh, quite a nice outfit but this is a replica of a trilobite that lived 380 million years ago on this site and uh, she did a really fine job with this and uh, it really works out well. And during our Children's Day program, which is the first Sunday in June every year, uh, Tilly comes out with uh, Don Bird from Buff State in one of his di dinosaur outfits, oh, the Dionicus, and we have both Tilly and the dinosaur walk out from behind one of the hills and it's really quite an, a surprise to everyone, you know? It's something you won't really see on this site. You won't find dinosaur remains here. Most of the remains that are here are lived in oceans 380 million years ago so we're looking mostly at invertebrate fossils except for the fossil fish so the dinosaurs came much later you know they were they didn't get here until about 250 million years ago so uh, Tilly is one of our oldest uh, living replicas uh, of the site and she's here quite often in fact Peg also does a lot of our uh, field trip programs and things like that, too. Great. So. Now, how large, this is probably larger than a regular trilobite, how large were they really? Well, most of the, yeah, most of the trilobites here may be an inch to two inches in size on this mm -hmm. site, but okay. trilobites did get up to 24 to 30 inches in size okay. uh, in the Onondaga limestone, and that's the rock unit that's in the expressway, Kensington Expressway there, uh, and also out at the intersection of 290 and Route 5 there, the old Vogelsanger Quarry next to Lord Amherst, there used to be a trilobite that lived there called Terra Taspis, and there's an example of that at the museum, and that got up to 24 to 30 inches in size, so it was really a pretty good size one. Oh, yeah. but a big, a big critter, you know? So, but most of them here are, you know, one to two inches, and sometimes they get very small, too, less than a half an inch sometimes. But uh, everyone comes to collect trilobites, and uh, so far, no one's stolen Tilly, and we're <laughs> glad to see that, because we need to have her out here to help out with everything.
Maybe Tilly, you could do a turn around for us so we could see the back of your. That is just great. <laughs> now, now, you volunteer here at the site. Tell us a little bit about your background. <laughs> um, and can we see Tilly on most of the days that uh, people would come by, the public days? Well, actually, uh, most of, not all the public days, but just special ones we special do. Ones? You know, in okay. fact, Tilly will be out here again in October when we do that Earth Science uh, Day, okay. October 17th. And uh, our Children's Day program, she's always here. And on special occasions, we have her out, too. So we, it's more special events because, as you can tell with the weather today, it's very warm in that outfit. You know, and Tilly's, <laughs> really, yeah, Tilly's really sweating today, I think, too. <laughs> Well, thanks very much for, for being on the show. And we're going to continue to look around the site. It's such a bright, sunny day, so we're kind of squinting into the sun, but we are enjoying every minute of our day here at Penn Dixie. And right now I'm with Peg Herman, and you won't recognize her because you, you saw her in slightly different guise. But, um, Peg, you're in charge of the educational programs? Right, the school coordination for children pre-K straight up to the 12th year of high school. And we have them come out here in the spring season and in the fall season. We usually start mid-April for the spring season and run straight through till school closes in June, third oh. week of June. This past spring we had 22 schools out for right. tours straight through from pre-K to 12. And then this fall season starts usually the last week of September straight through to about the second week of November is when we have our last mm -hmm. tour out this area. And it's a lot of fun for the kids. At first, some of them don't want to get their hands dirty and get into the mud. And we've had a few come out here and go, ah. But then their teachers have to drag them back on the bus after they find their first fossil. And um, there's certain little skills that we teach them and how to look for the fossils. Um, one is what I call a safe fossil hunter's distance, where you teach them to spread their arms out apart okay. and just do a circle. And if they keep that distance away from one another, they're capable to find the fossils just by looking in a circle around their feet. Wow, that's and that's because this area is so weathered that the fossils just pop up to the surface and are right on the ground. Yeah. And one of the neat aspects of the school tours here is that the kids don't need to have any tools other than a bag in their hands. Great. So, um, um, you've mentioned that you have all ages. Um, yeah. do you, uh, how do you tailor it to the different age groups that you have? Usually we tailor it according to what the teachers would be wanting and expecting. Um, I discuss this with them before they bring the children out. Pre-K's attention span is a little bit less than the older kids, so they're happy to and contented to hunt. They want to get right in and dig right away. Oh, sure. So they don't get a history of the site too much. They get the history as they're digging and working in the ground. We go around one to one and tell them a little bit about how old the area is and the fact that it was under sea. And then when you get into the fourth and fifth and sixth graders, their teachers want them to have a little more history so we give them a history of the site as we walk out onto the site we have the Monica shales on the far side of the site going graduating down into the Wyndham shales okay. and then we have two various pyrite beds that can be seen as you walk across the site then we have various beds this is entire area here is all fossil beds but within each part of the area are certain kinds of fossils that can be found um, your horn corals would be found on that side and then back over here is an area we call crinoid heaven, which we take them to. And then there's Brachiopod Hill. And then on my other side over here is an area where you can find cephalopods and gastropods and trilobites in the shales. Another neat aspect that we get into with the older children is the fact that this area one time was covered by a mile high glacier. And if, um, it's difficult for them to comprehend the height of it, yeah. but you tell them, look over the tops of the trees, and it was higher than the tops of the trees. And there's glacier rocks can be found on that side of the site. There'd be rocks with a lot of scratches in them, which would be 15,000 years old. Wow. And when you get into the high school level students, mostly their teachers work with them, and they're out here to dig and to actually find specimens mm -hmm. and to take them back and to research them within their classes. And that, but with the high school students, often they're the ones that don't want to be here until they find their first fossil, and then they don't want to go back to the school. <laughs> so it's, it's a lot of fun for myself, for all the volunteers, and also for the students and the teachers. It's a neat experience. Now you've had some large uh, tour groups, too. So if somebody was thinking of bringing a large group of students, you can certainly accommodate that. Tell us about some of the large groups. As we walked over here, we were talking about some of this. 
the largest group that we've had out came out from Kenmore East, um, and there was about 289 students out that particular day. And it boils down to making sure that we have enough teachers' coverage, and we call in all our volunteers mm -hmm. and ask them to come out. And we split the groups up into probably groups of 25 to 50, depending on the age bracket. With the younger children, the pre-K, I try to limit the size of the group to no more than 50, but I encourage the parents to come out with oh, them too. Good. So it basically balances out. And we had one day where we had another 200 to 300 students out, where Williamsville was out to do a cleanup project and another school from the city of Buffalo was out to do the actual fossil hunt so we had them working together and that one group was cleaning up while the others were hunting for fossils and then the others helped and joined in fossil hunting too. And it's a unique experience for a lot of schools. So if a teacher wanted to contact you to find out more information about bringing their class here and they're watching right now and saying, how, oh, we've got to do that, how can they get a hold of you and, and arrange this? Okay, they can reach me through the the regular Hamburg Natural History Society number, which is 6274560, and that'll give them some information. And if they want to talk to the person and actually schedule a tour, you can reach me at 627-6335. And I basically just do the school coordination, and I'll work it out according to how it works best for schools. Some of the schools like to have a bus come out with 50 or 60 students on. Other schools find it less expensive to use the shuttle bus service, so which would mean they'd have be two groups coming out in one day. And basically our society is willing to work with the school in whatever works for the school. So it's very um, beneficial for the school. Oh, that's exciting. I'm so glad you have such wonderful programs for students. I want to just go into one other thing. Um, we saw the trilobite costume earlier, and you did tell me how many hours you spent putting that together, because yes. it is so impressive, and it's just beautiful. Could you just share that with the audience, because I think that would impress them also. That is another part of the unique learning experience I get into with the kids that aren't all into the digging mm -hmm. and fossils, that are into the arts and like the arts and want to get into things like drama and music and just the actual drawing arts. The costume took me 280 hours to make. It started out as a wire sculpture and around the wire sculpture was put some quilting batting so that it's protected on both sides and then um, it was pieced together with fabric over the top and sewn together in that process and it was a way like quilting only over the top of a wired structure. And as I was making it, my family enjoyed watching me do that. And the standard joke in the house now is that neither of our sons or daughters can get married unless the person they're engaged to can accept that mom is a trilobite. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> well, thanks very much and good luck with the rest of the, the school season you know, th you. this fall. It's really great and great to learn about all these opportunities. Thank you for your time, too. Hi, I'm here with the Vice President of the organization, Esther Cole, and she's in charge of the winter winter programs winter, that you give. Right, the winter programming. In the winter when you can't dig because of the snow in western New York, but once in a while we get a break in the weather, we do come out in the winter if it's warmer. <laughs> and if the breeze isn't too cold, we will come out and some people will try to dig. But the ground is frozen, so it, it can be a problem. But during the winter months, from January February, March, and then we start again out in the field in April. We will offer programs on either dinosaurs, preparing your fossils, identifying your fossils. And in this year, in October, Dr. Lewis Pribble from the Smithsonian will be giving a program, and we're going to have it at Hilbert College on October 15th at 7.30. He'll be talking about the Green River Formation of Insects in Colorado which is a little different than this area, but it's still going to be a lot of information on how these insects were created into fossils. What were they? How did we see this fossil genealogy to our present day in insects? How are they related and what will happen? It should be a great, great program. Saturday, October 17th, which is part of Earth Science Week, this whole area will be filled with geologists, different organizations from env en environment and ecology. Uh, Maxim is going to do core drilling here so you can actually see an earth core from this shale bed. Uh, we'll have people from the Buffalo Museum of Science, astrology groups, all represented here to give a nice Earth Day program from 9 to 3 so you get a full picture of earth science and geology in New York State. Now you also do programs where you go into the schools and talk to, to, to groups. Tell right. us a little bit about that. 
Well, Jerry and I have gone into the schools and talked to various ninth grade, mostly ninth grades, because that's the earth science, the year they take earth science, and talked to them about the Pendixie, how to find fossils, the geology of this area. We also have school groups that come out here to explore the area. We do senior citizen groups in October. There'll be a series of programs at the Lackawanna Public Library about geology and fossils that um, different members will do for groups. Uh, let me just, uh, last year we did have a, one of our members, John Spina, he went up to the British Columbia in the British Rocky Mountain chain to a very famous site called the Burgess Shale. Not everybody can get there, you have to dig by permit and the Canadian government does not allow you to keep those fossils, but he went up there for nine weeks to study and gave a wonderful talk last year. And those are fossils of animals and creatures that they are just identifying and just giving names to. Never been seen before. Oh my goodness, that's incredible. I'm really impressed that the so society has activities year round, not just in the good weather, but you have information and, and educational things going on all the time. That's terrific. Yeah, we offer a lot to different people who are amateurs and professional, and you get to mix with both groups of people and learn an awful lot in a relaxed setting. That's great. Tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get involved with the society? Well, Jerry and I have lived in the town of Hamburg all our life and has known each other for many, many years and got together and have gone on many, many digs and then got together and decided that we have to save this site because there aren't many places left anymore where families, amateurs, people who just want to come out and dig for fossils can come, take what they find. They're becoming very rare. You cannot go to dinosaur sites and take what you find. You cannot go to too many places. And this is a unique area. Western New York, particularly Hamburg, is famous for its fossil formations and for the cliffs out on the lake. And all of our shales, Wyndham Shale, Wanaka Shale, are all names known throughout the world that identify the shale that we found here in this area. And we just have a grand time, and Jerry and I felt it was important to allow people to have the feeling of being outside to dig and feel what it's like to be a real geologist in the field. The old Indiana Jones or the um, Jurassic Park effect. Yeah. But you're getting that same idea. Yeah, It's just great. We're having a wonderful time. Thanks. We're going to continue our exploration of the site. We're in another section of the Pendixie site, and oh wow, what have you found? Well, we found a brachiopod, and this is a 380 million year old animal that lived on the seafloor bottom. It was a muddy seafloor bottom, and it had two valves to it, but uh, very similar to a clam, but they are a little bit different. But uh, you can find a lot of brachiopods just laying on the surface, and right next to it is a little crinoid stem. Oh, yeah. These little stems held the animal up off the seafloor bottom. The other, this is a different type of animal we call the sea lily. And so crinoid stems are really all over the place. In fact, you'll see them all over. Here's a big one right back here. You can see this one's a little bit more together. And then there's also a bunch of horn corals here that are just laying on the surface too. And these little animals lived in the seafloor bottom with their pointed section down into the seafloor, something like that. And these are all over the site, just laying uh, around the site everywhere to be found. And, and this is typical of finding them so close, just right, like this? Right. In fact, you're probably, Judy, actually sitting on fossils and everything. In fact, parts of fossils all over the site here. What happens is when it rains, it, the lower section of the quarry here just washes out all these fossils and they're just laying on the surface. And what these animals represent are an environment that was here 380 million years ago. It was a warm tropical sea and it had a mud bottom and these animals attach themselves to the seafloor bottom and uh, what we're looking at now are things that have been buried by those muds and preserved for 380 million years. The nice thing about the Pendixie site is is that the entire site is underlain by this fossiliferous layer and will never run out of fossils there. You know, so there's hundreds and thousands of fossils being taken out of here every year and they continue to be weathered out and they're just laying on the ground for people to find. And in most cases the, the amazing thing is that most people when they find these are the first people to see these animals in 380 million years, which is a long time. So uh, there's a large variety of, of fossils to be found here and uh, sometimes you have to really dig for them. You can see that people are digging into the ground and that's sometimes where you find the better uh, fossils, especially the trilobites, more complete trilobites than that. But the horn corals and the crinoid stems and the brachiopods are, are playing everywhere across the site. Now you mentioned some different types of shale at either end of the, the site. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what those are? Uh, 
the shales, well, some of the shales at the southern end of the site don't contain quite as much, as many fossils, and uh, probably the sedimentation rate was higher then, mm -hmm. and there were less fo uh, animals living in that type of water at that time. So you have sections of the site where there's not a lot of fossils, and then there's sections where there are a great abundance and a large variety and diversity of different types of fossils to be found. So um, you have two different sections, and, uh, and also at the southern end of the site, we have a section of limestones in which there were fossil fish plates uh, that were... Uh, can be found and there were had we had Devonian age sharks that were here at that time these sharks that were swimming through the waters had uh, armor plating around their heads and the armor plating was made up of bone material and that's what we find preserved in the rocks you don't see uh, fossil fish here like you do from the Green River Formation out west like the regular bony material but what you're looking at here are bony material that, that's really sort of black and uh, just sections of the animals head head structure itself so, uh, and then behind, oh, behind us, where they're digging back here, behind us, they're digging in a limestone layer, and this is the Titchener limestone, and this underlies the entire site, too. It's very hard rock, um, and there are a lot of fossils in there, but it's difficult to get those, those animals out. So, so they're really chipping away there. Yeah, they really are chipping away, and uh, you really should be wearing some glass, glasses and things like that, like he is, to protect your eyes when you do that, too. It's something you've got to watch out for. But... It's difficult sometimes to get the real good fossils out of the limestone, but it is intriguing. And you notice the color of the limestone, too, is sort of a reddish color. And uh, what that is, is pyrite is on there, fool's gold, and it's oxidized, and it's sort of a rusty color now. So actually, it's fool's gold that's on top of that rock material. So, so no matter how much uh, time or effort you might have to put in at the, at the site on any one day, you could maybe find things, like for smaller children, it would be fun to find something that's right up on the ground. But if you wanted to take more time, such as these people are, and really you know, be working away at it, there's something for everybody. Oh yeah, there is. In fact, we encourage people to go ahead and dig holes in the site, and that's what we want. We want people to dig down in and get into the fresher rock, and that's where you can find some of the more rarer types of fossils, some of the cephalopods, trilobites, and things like that. So we encourage that sort of activity, you know, to do that. And uh, there are things here for everybody. There's no question about it. Give us the phone number again, too, if people wanted information yeah. on coming down and joining the folks here who are having such a good time. Yeah, yeah you can contact the Hamburg Natural History Society at 627-456 six zero and we'd be glad to pass along information on our programs and uh, schedule a field trip for you too. What you're looking at right now are some wonderful fossils that have been found by a Weebelow's den that's visiting the site for their first time. Is that correct? That, that's correct. It's our first time out to the quarry but we've brought a group of boys every three years at the end of March for the geology show they have. They have people with all kinds of interesting rocks and minerals from all over the world and they really make it make the kids feel welcome too they have at their geology show a quarry where kids can go in and dig in buckets of dirt and take home all kinds of fossils and rock specimens from all over that they get to take home and they also have an a treasure hunt of sorts or i guess a scavenger hunt where the kids have a questionnaire and they have to go through some of the different exhibits in order to excuse me in order to get answers to their questions and the kids in, enjoy that the scavenger hunt part of it, and enjoy getting to take out all the interesting specimens home I know it's great that an organization like this makes kids feel welcome and I'm sure it's good for the organization too in order to develop interest in, in new things and at some point maybe even get new members for their group and tell us some your name and, and where's your group from my name is Dennis Smith our Cub Scout Pack 279 is sponsored by Dodge Elementary School PTA in East Amherst. Um, what's your name? David. David, how do you like um, doing this? Is this fun? Yeah. Tell us what you found. Um, Lots of things, right? Yeah. Had you ever done this before? No. It was pretty easy to learn though, huh? Yeah. Enjoyable? You think you'd like to come back and do it again? Yeah. What's your name? Thomas. How do you like doing this, Tom? It's fun. Fun? Really fun? Tell us about what you found today. Just horned coral and lots of it. <laughs> now, did you know what horned coral was before you came today? I still don't. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going to be learning as the day goes on, right? You're doing a great job working right here. Uh, tell us, what's your name? Patrick. Patrick, tell us what you found. I just really found things, rocks that interested me that just... <laughs> Mostly fossils, but now are you guys interested in science in general? I mean, definitely. Yeah. 
Okay. Do you think that you um, this is going to help you a lot in school as far as the different things that you're learning? Yeah, probably. Would you recommend this to to other you know organizations that might be thinking of bringing the kids out? Oh, definitely. It's a great thing for the kids to come out and get some hands-on experience and, and find things for themselves. And the people at the organization have been very helpful too, coming around and helping to identify some of the things that that we found and have been very encouraging. So, so we, we feel very welcome and we'll definitely be out again ourselves. Terrific. Hey, well thanks very much and good luck with the rest of your work. Sure, thank you. We're at the far northern end of the site right now, and tell us what, what are your plans for this area? Well, Julia, we're standing in the middle of a, a former uh, pond area, which many years ago people used to swim in. You can see right now we really can't swim in this. But as part of a wetland mitigation project, we have a local developer that's going to come in uh, later this year or early next year and excavate this area out, reconstruct it, and revegetate the ponds. There's one, we're standing in the larger of two ponds right now. They're going to come in and excavate out both of them, connect the two, and make a, sort of an open water area and a, a shallow wetland area itself with a maximum depth of 24 to 30 inches in, in depth in the water in the center part. And we'll be able to run our nature trail around it. It'll be great for birds, and we hope for a lot of wildlife and water studies and things like that for the local high school. So we have a real opportunity here to go ahead and develop it and put in some bird uh, houses and different things like that. And it should be, as it is, a great birding area now. We hope to enhance that. And as you can see, as you we're standing in the, the mud here, there's a lot of deer tracks around, and we do have deer and turkey on the property and we're under a major hawk route so we're really pretty excited about this wetland being done and the local high schools are also interested because uh, they'll be able to bring their groups out here and it'll make a good area to do some wetland studies and things like that. We also hope to videotape this process when it's being developed and use it sort of as an outdoor classroom and that's sort of the focus of the whole Penn Dixie site is to be an outdoor educational center and that's what we're really looking to do. We are, we're not a museum, we're an outdoor education center and we want to have programs along those lines in the natural sciences and this is going to really complement the site a lot and add a lot to the site so we're pretty excited about this going on. It's going to be a good time. Great, great, good luck with it. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm here surrounded by a group of Girl Scouts who have been here for a couple hours looking for some wonderful fossils and they've been showing me all the things they've found. They found a lot of wonderful things. I want to ask them their names and maybe a little bit about what they found and, and also if you would tell me what troops you're from because we have two Girl Scout troops that are represented today. What's your name? Natalie. And what troop are you from, Natalie? 736. What did you find today? You've got a handful. Um, I found coral. C stems. Had you ever been here before to do this? No. Was it fun? Mm-hmm. Would you recommend this to other students your age? Yes. Great. What's your name? Jenna. And um, is this your first visit or have you been here before? Um, my first visit. Tell us what you found. I found a lot of coral. Um, uh, I found some lamb shells mm -hmm. and some lily lilies I think they're called. Wow, you've done great. Hey, what's your name? Kate. And what troop are you from? For uh, 547. And you're working on a badge yeah. uh, about this? Tell us a little bit about the badge. Um, it's the geology, geology badge. What did you find today? Um, Not lots of stuff? I found a lot of coral and um, some trilobites and um, clam shells. Terrific. Good for you. What's your name? Caitlin. And which troop are you from? Um, 547. And tell us about some of the things that you found. Do you have a good time doing this? Yes. Um, I found some clams and uh, corals. And was it easy to do? Were there things like right on the surface? Did you have to dig? Did you do some digging down into the ground? Um, just a little bit of digging. But other than that, it was really fun and you would recommend this? Yes. We're terrific. Okay, and what's your name? Elizabeth. And what troop are you from? Number 547. What did you find? You've got some wonderful things. I found a trilobite, some brachypods, a coral, and a clam. Wow, lots of great things. Um, this is the, the geology is one of the badges that you can work on. I bet you do a lot of different badges and activities during yeah. the year, right? Mm -hmm. So you've enjoyed the geology badge so far? Yeah. Terrific. Now, I know you've been here a couple times. Come on right out so the camera can see you. You mentioned that this is your third visit to the site? Second. Second. What do you like best about it? Um, I like finding the fossils. You know, I didn't ask you your name, sorry, and your troop number. <laughs> Caitlin, and I'm from Troop 547. 
So you like finding the fossils. Do you think it's a lot of fun? Would you recommend it to other students your age? Yes. Perfect. Thanks. What's your name? Jacqueline. And what troop are you from? 736. What all have you found today? Corals, trilobites, and some other things. Now, do you all work together on this? You've kind of been digging in sort of the same area, but just have you all kind of have your own little areas? Yeah. Great. Did you enjoy it? A good thing to do for a, a Saturday afternoon? Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. What's your name? Katie. And Katie, you have a... a a cup with a lot of wonderful things in. Tell us kind of some of the things you have in there. I have some coral, uh, different brachiopods, and a bunch of sea coral. Now, did you know about these um, before you came here, or did you learn? Did you know what a brachiopod was before you came? Did you know what these things were? You learned yeah. these today. Okay, so you you guys had done some studying ahead of time. That's great. Congratulations! You found a lot of good things. You have a tremendous display here. This is great. Tell us your name and your troop. Um, my name is Jessica, and I'm tr from Troop 547. What have you found? I found a lot of coral, tons of crinoids, and a lot of sea lilies. Now, what condition are they in? Are a lot of them in, in little pieces, or do you find some whole ones? I find some whole ones, and some, they're very delicate, and they can break really easily. Do you have to be careful? Is that why you have the cloth in there, or the yeah. paper towel? They need to be cushioned. Great. I would really recommend this. Yeah. Really Thanks. Hi, what's your name in your troop? Janine, troop 547. And what do you like best about coming here? Um, just finding stuff. Did, were you real successful today? Did you find a lot of good things? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about some of the things you found. Um, well, I, well, I found a lot of coral, mm -hmm. sea, sea lilies. Terrific, terrific. Now they were kind of near the surface. Is that where you found yours, or how did you? Um, they were near the surface. Great. And what's your name and your troop? My name is Stephanie Mack, and my troop is 736. And what all have you found? You've got some neat things here. Tell us about those. Um, this is coral, and these are some fossils. Ooh, those are great. Have you been here before? No. What do, what do you think about your first visit? You're spending the afternoon digging for fossils. Was it what you thought it would be? Was it more fun? I liked it a lot. I thought it was more fun than I thought it would be. <laughs> great. So you'll be getting your geology badge soon? Now, how many more activities do you have to do to get the badge? Do you I thought this would be our last activity. Great. Well, congratulations to, to, both, to all of you from both troops, and thanks for joining us. And we'll continue our tour of the site. Organizations depend so much on their volunteers, and we have some of the wonderful volunteers of the society right here, and they're going to tell us how they got started and what draws them back to work here. Um, tell us, what is your background, and how did you get started doing this? I just started as a volunteer earlier this spring. I have no formal education in geology or paleontology, but I'm, I've always been interested in looking for fossils, and this is a place to look for them, and I like to help kids find them, too. What kind of um, reactions do you get from the kids as they're finding different things? Are they surprised? Gold. They think they have a treasure. And they walk out of here with a bucket of fossils and they think they're rich. And it's just something they've never done. Oh, that's great. Um, now tell us your background. How did you get started? Um, I major in biology in college, but uh, I, I've always been interested in natural sciences. And uh, I just uh, came with a Cub Scout group last year, got interested in it, joined, and uh, I've been volunteering ever since. Terrific. I've enjoyed it. Now, um, what do you do as a volunteer? What are some of the things that you've worked on? Um, we help, we're tour guides. We help people identify the fossils and tell them where to look for them and things like that. And they enjoy it. Sounds yeah. like fun. It is. Good for you. Yeah. Um, and tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get started and what do you like best about this? I, re I just retired in October and Mark got me involved in it. We used to work together. And uh, I just like meeting all the people and digging in the dirt. Hey, well, good for you. It sounds great. Oh, and down here, and I'm going to walk in front of everybody here to interview this gentleman. But tell us a little bit about your background. How'd you get started? Well, with uh, my wife being with the directors at the time, she said we're having a cleanup. So, with a pickup truck and a trailer, I came out for our first cleanup back in '93, and then working midnights, seeing the expressions on all these little kids' faces and what you get the enjoyment of a school with little kids coming here and you show them where to dig, what to look for, how to find it and explain what they, and the smiles on their faces. But anytime we can come out, clean up or help park cars or assist elderly to come through, anything we can do, plus getting funds for them, helping to 
set up nice finds with Ford Motor Company. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to walk between you here, folks. And I want to ask Jerry a little bit about if people watching want to become volunteers, you know, visit the site, find out, but become a little more involved. Tell us about what you offer for them. Yeah, well, we, uh, we are always looking for volunteers to help us out. We generally do a volunteer training program in the spring. We uh, do a three-hour program, and we actually bring them down on the site. We have groups down here so they can see how easy it is to do a trip after you learn things. We have enough literature uh, about the fossils and about the site that it makes it very easy for them to do trips and things like that and help out, and actually they've learned a lot. Without the volunteers, we wouldn't be able to do the program we do out here. Even like today, we have you know a few hundred people out here, and without the volunteers, we would not be able to cover all this, and they make a real essential part of our program. Programming. And we've got 40 to 50 uh, volunteers all together. And not only do they do the tours here, too, we do a lot of exhibits, like at the Hamburg Trade Fair, the Buffalo Water Fest, Buffalo Geological Society showing that, and they help man those booths, too, and talk about the programming. And all that stuff is very, very important to us. So if they're interested, you know, in becoming a volunteer, anyone is, you can contact us at 627-4560 uh, and leave a message, and we'll get back to you, because we're always looking for new volunteers. And when we find that a lot of people, once they get out here and see what's going on, they really enjoy it. And a lot of the programs we have are getting very diversified too so uh, there's an interest just about for everyone you know if you're interested in the outdoors this is the place to be you know great thanks okay thank you we really enjoyed our day here at Penn Dixie and uh, Jerry any closing thoughts and, and give us again the phone number of course well the phone number to contact us is 627-4560 and we'd be glad to schedule a school group a scouting group or if you're interested in volunteering or even taking out a membership to help support us we'd certainly be glad to hear from you we're always looking for uh, new members and we're looking for ways to raise money to help put together the uh, building on the site and do the nature trails and the pond and everything else so we're looking for about 1.75 million dollars and uh, we're ambitious but we're going to go get it and uh, we have a real nice uh, program out here and we hope to develop it even further too so and I just wanted to show everyone the the brochure uh, for the Hamburg Natural History Society um, there is a map to the site on the back it's very easy to get to in fact we're, we were coming from Lockport and we thought oh wow it's gonna take forever to get there we were here in no time so don't let that stop you if you live up in northern Niagara County or if you're in Orleans County wherever you might be coming from it's very easy to get to um, there's convenient parking it's a wonderful day for you or your organization or bring your kids um, as you can see there were so many people here today just enjoying enjoying themselves and learning a lot but having fun doing it and isn't that the whole point so again thanks Jerry well, thank really you for coming Judy we're really glad, really glad to have everyone here and if they do call in they can leave their address and we'll send them out one of those flyers Great. so thank you thanks a lot Bye. thanks for joining us on science today mm -hmm.